Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Is Automation Live. I'm your host, Corey Dallas, and today we're going to be talking about PID controllers. We're going to try to get it in just 10 minutes, so we're going to jump through all of these announcements. So today's PID, coming up next, we're going to be talking about ladder logic, ladder diagram, and then after that, we've got structured text. If you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. You can do that by hitting the button below, and go ahead and hit that bell icon so you get notifications every time we go live or post another video. All right, so like I said, we're on a time schedule today, so let's go ahead and get started talking about PIDs. So before we get into PID in and of itself, I wanted to quickly talk about some of the, the basics of control. So there's kind of two types. One is open loop, the other one's, contr or the other one's closed loop. Um, each of them have similar components with one minor difference. So typically we're looking at some reference value that's being fed into our controller. And then that controller is going to give us an output that's going into our controlled system. And then from there, we'll get the actual value. So that, that's kind of what an open loop block diagram would look like. If we move to closed loop, it's pretty similar, except for we have feedback. So we're actually taking that actual value, that output value that we get and feeding it back um, so that we know really how far off we are from our set point or our reference value. The easiest way to look at this is, is really to just uh, come up with a real life example. Uh, the most common one that I use is, is just your thermostat in your house, right? So it's a, a, an example of a control loop, um, a closed loop control system. So you're gonna set a temperature, right? That may be 72 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the summer, or if you're uh, a little more uh, conservative, maybe set it to 75 in the summer, something like that. Um, but we're gonna have some set temperature. That's gonna be our reference value. Our controller is really the, the thermostat itself. Um, so it's got some brains inside of it. And from there, that thermostat's actually controlling your AC or heater. So that would be the system or process that we're controlling. So the output of the thermostat uh, indicates to your AC or to your heater system how much uh, and when uh, to, to turn on. And then from there, we have our actual temperature. So that's the output of this system, right? Um, is, is the actual value. It's gonna be the temperature that's in your house. So just because you set it to 72 doesn't mean it's actually 72 in your house. And that's where closed loop comes into play. So we set it to 72, but our house is actually uh, 75. Uh, so we need to cool it down a little bit. Um, because we have closed loop, we're getting some feedback from the actual temperature. We can um, actually change the way we're controlling it based on the behavior of that uh, error. That's what we call that. Dif the difference between the actual and the reference is called the error. So depending on uh, if that error is really big or if that error is changing over time, uh, we can make changes to the way we're controlling. So the most common way um, that we see that done in the context of a controller is actually with PID. So when we're talking about PID, it's gonna be sitting inside of this controller block in our block diagram. So for example, inside the thermostat in, in the example we we're talking about. And when we talk about PID, it's really kind of three independent components that are added together. So PID really just stands for proportional, integral derivative. Um, don't worry, we're not gonna talk about any of the math today. Um, so we're gonna try to keep it high level and simple and just explain what these things mean and how they change the control. Okay, so know that three different components, proportional, integral, and derivative. So let's go through those and try to understand how they impact a system when we use them. So first is the P component. This is the proportional component as we've already talked about. What the P component does is it amplifies the error proportionally. And we'll look at a quick example of this. So if this uh, doesn't quite make sense to you, don't worry, we're gonna look at a real example using our thermostat. Okay, this also helps improve the reaction time to errors. And we do that with something that we call a gain. So the proportional gain is typically denoted as KP. Okay, so if we were to increase KP, that would increase the speed of the response. Um, but sometimes if you increase it too much, you may introduce some oscillations into the system. So you, you may see that sometimes when you're tuning a PID loop. Uh, so if you decrease KP, you're gonna reduce oscillations, but also reduce uh, the speed of the response. So there's always a balance in each of these. You'll see that. Let's look at a quick example. So let's say we've got our thermostat here, uh, our, our little green block. I've set it to 72 degrees Fahrenheit uh, because I like to keep it nice and comfortable. Um, but it's actually 64 degrees in my house. So our little thermometer here is, is the actual temperature inside my house. That means it's eight degrees Fahrenheit too cold. All right, so the thermostat's gonna kick on uh, and try to heat up, right? Now, where we can use a P component here uh, 
is basically taking the error. So again, the difference, we were before we were saying eight degrees too cold and amplifying it. So this will make our controller react faster, kind of artificially uh, increasing the error. So in this case, let's say we selected a, a KP, a proportional gain of 10. That's gonna amplify our error by a factor of 10. So instead of uh, thinking it's eight degrees too cold and like maybe we don't need to react too quickly, I, it's saying it's 80 degrees too cold. So wow, we're really gonna kick things on and, and ramp up. So you can see how this can, can increase um, the uh, reaction time, um, but also there's the potential for overshooting and instability if, if we increase it by too much. So for example, you know, if we said it's 800 degrees too cold, the emergency heat might kick on and uh, our system's gonna overshoot and um, not react you know, as intelligently as possible. So how can we fix that issue that's introduced by using just the P component? We have other components, so thankfully those are gonna help us out. So let's start talking about the I component. So the I component again is the integral component and the integral component is looking at um, the relative history of the error. So one of the things that we see the I component used for most commonly is reducing steady state error. So what is steady state error? That just means that once your system has um, you know, gotten to steady state where it's, it's constant basically, um, it could still have an error. So again, let, let's use our thermostat example because we're, we're kind of all in that mindset. We have it set to 72, but we're at 68 and it's not changing. Okay, that's an example of steady state error. The integral component is really good at fixing those kinds of issues because it's looking at how much error is accumulating over time. So even if we're just a couple degrees off and our proportional isn't really gonna make a big change, our integral component is actually going to kind of spool up. And if, you know, the longer we have error, the more and more it's gonna make an impact. Okay, so um, let's again look at the integral gain. So sometimes this is den denoted as Ki, you may see Ti, um, there's kind of two ways to look at this. We won't talk about the, the nuances there, but just know you may see that and so it's a little bit different. Um, if we increase our Ki, that's gonna reduce our steady state error. We already talked about why that's gonna happen, but again, um, you can have some overshoot um, that, that's introduced by that um, and also a longer settling time. So as you increase your uh, integral gain, you may get overshoot even though you're overshooting now right around your set point. Okay, so in some cases you may wanna bring that back down if, if those uh, types of phenomenons are becoming more and more prevalent. Okay, a uh, quick real life example. So, so this is kind of what we were already talking about. Our thermostat is set to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. It's actually 71 degrees in my house. You know, if I just have the P component going, it's probably not going to really be doing much, right? So it's saying, yeah, it's, it's one degree too cold. It's not a big deal. We're not gonna worry about it all that much. Now let's look at what, what would happen if we had an I component introduced. So we have it set to 72 degrees. It's actually 71 and we're not gonna pick a real number. Let's just say we have some integral gain. Again, that one degree is gonna to turn to two degrees and then to three degrees and then to four degrees. And you know, all of a sudden we have something that's telling us, hey, we're way too cold. It's 80 degrees too cold because we've got this small error building up over time. So that's what the integral component does. It looks at the history of the error and accumulates it over time. Okay, again, great for steady state error, but can it introduce oscillations um, and some other issues? All right, so let's look at our last component, the D component. Again, D stands for derivative uh, based in some, some mathematics uh, that we're not gonna talk about today, um, but just know that it's kind of the opposite of the integral. So where the integral was looking at the history of error, the derivative is really looking at the future of the error. Obviously we can't see into the future, but what we can do is see how our error is changing over time and that's going to predict what it's gonna look like in the future. So really when we're talking about the derivative component, we're looking at the rate of change of the error. So if we have a really fast rate of change, then our output is gonna change quickly. But if we have a slow rate of change, our output is going to change very slowly. Um, so this can improve the stability, uh, reduce oscillations. It's gonna reduce overshoot as we increase our derivative gain, um, but this can cause some issues if there's noisy conditions. Um, and when we, when we say that, we mean that, that our a sensor could be noisy, for example, that's giving us uh, the feedback. Um, so you have to be a little careful when using the D component to make sure that your system is still um, stable relative to noise, um, but also that you're getting the best benefits. Uh, so again, you know, the, the one important note here is that the derivative is changing based on the future or expected future of the error. So 
if there's no change at all, then the derivative's not going to contribute anything. Uh, so if the error is constant, even if it's big, the derivative won't do anything. Okay, so you can kind of see how these are starting to complement each other to create, when we add them together, a really comprehensive control solution. So let's look at our thermostat example. You know, we just gave this example. Let's say it's set to 72, it's actually 64 in my house. You would think um, that I would want to turn on the heat, which I do, but the derivative component, since it's just looking at the rate of change, it sees that, hey, we're con consistently at 64. So I don't really care. It's not changing, I don't care. Okay, so that's what the D component thinks like. All right, it's kind of apathetic in that way. But let's say we had a drop from 64 degrees to 54 degrees in one second. Um, I really hope this doesn't happen in my house, but here's where the derivative component is gonna kick in and say, wow, we've got a really big rate of change in our error. We've gone you know, 10 degrees Fahrenheit in one second. So uh, that would mean that our error has gone from uh, eight degrees, that's 72 minus 64, to 18 degrees, uh, 72 minus 54. So you can see our error is changing there very quickly. That's when the derivative component is gonna kick in. So this is really helpful, again, when we've got those overshoots, uh, we see the, the rate of change of the error will start to increase as we get closer and closer to our set point. Um, the derivative component can really help smooth that out. So you'll go from a curve that has a lot of oscillations to one that kind of smoothly comes onto the set point. That's where the derivative component is really helpful. So again, let's come back to our a uh, little block diagram here where we had controller before, we're just looking at a PID controller and a PID controller is just as simple as all of those three independent elements combined together. So we've got our P plus our I plus our D. You get kind of the best of both worlds. There's tuning that needs to happen anytime you're introducing a PID controller into a system based on all of the dynamics of the system. Uh, so for example, a, a pressure-based system is gonna react differently than a temperature-based system. Um, and the specifics of that system will, will of course change. So you'll have to tune those independent values, but now that you know how they contribute to the control, you can have a better idea of what to do when you're implementing this, and hopefully you understand a little bit better how PID control works without even looking at any math. So that's our quick, quick intro to PID control. I think we went a little bit over 10 minutes, but hey, that's okay, right? Uh, we can't be perfect every time. So uh, looking into the future, uh, do subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit notifications and take a look through the upcoming live streams that we have. Uh, just quickly, we've got our PLC basic series on ladder logic uh, next week. And then the week after that, we'll be talking about structured text uh, kind of ongoing from our discussion about uh, PLC programming languages. So if those seem interesting to you, make sure you hit that little bell icon, set up notifications for those episodes, and we will see you next time on This Is Automation Live. Thanks for joining everyone.